Good evening. My name is Bill Randall. I'm a professor of gerontology here at St. Thomas University, and I'm a member of the coordinating team uh, for the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Narrative, otherwise known by us as CERN, not to be confused with that place over in uh, Switzerland where they bang particles together. On behalf of my CERN colleagues, uh, including Michelle of France, Sue Mackenzie Moore, Elizabeth McKim, Dolores Furlong, and Clive Baldwin, uh, Stu's uh, Canada Research Chair in Narrative Studies, please let me welcome you warmly to this year's John McEndy Memorial Lecture in Narrative. Up until his tragic and untimely death, John McEndy was a much loved member of the Stu faculty community and a founding member of CERN. And from the get-go, John's dream was to bring Arthur Frank to Fredericton to deliver the sort of lecture that will be treated to this evening. So John, if you don't know it already, your dream has come true at last. Thank all of you for coming, in particular Carol and Colleen, members of John's immediate family. And thanks uh, to um, a number of people, if you'll uh, bear with me for a second. I want to thank Jeffrey Carlton, uh, Stu's Director of Communication, uh, for helping us to spread the word about Frank's lecture this evening and the workshop he's doing over the next couple of days. Uh, Jeffrey's shown continuing support of our various endeavors at CERN, including uh, our online peer-reviewed journal. I have a little plug for that, if you don't mind, which we call Narrative Works, Issues, Investigations, and Interventions, another of John's dreams as well, to have a, a journal uh, devoted to narrative, uh, which thanks to my co-editor Elizabeth McKim is now in its uh, fifth issue, soon to be the sixth issue, six, soon to be the seventh. Okay, <laughs> uh, and we have uh, articles in these uh, uh, issues from uh, an interesting range of scholars and researchers from a variety of disciplines and countries. Anyway, an especially vigorous thank you goes to Lauren Eagle. Uh, Lauren Eagle is the administrative assistant to Clive and the Canada Research Chair in Narrative Studies because she has managed much of the legwork that's been involved in making uh, Frank's visit happen. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thanks, too, to uh, uh, Kim Wade of the Campus Bookstore, who's arranged for a number of uh, Dr. Frank's books to be on display in the lobby. Uh, after the question and answer session, uh, which will be chaired by Sue Mackenzie Moore, uh, Dr. Frank uh, will be happy to be on hand so that you can meet him personally and purchase signed copies of his, his works. One last thought, uh, for more information about CERN in general, narrative works in particular, and the various links and resources that can be found there, uh, we invite you to visit our website, www.stu.ca slash CERN. You got that? That'll be on the quiz at the end of the evening. To introduce our speaker this evening, I would now like to call upon Clive Baldwin, as I say, he's Canada Research Chair in Narrative Studies uh, professor of social work and director of CERN. He's a prince of a chap to work with and a brain uh, that simply does not stop. Clive. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, last year, I stood here and had to confess how intimidated I was to be meeting Deirdre McCluskey. This year I get to confess to feeling intimidated the first time I met Art Frank. Um, I don't know if you'll remember this, but um, at least it's an embarrassing story about me, not about our guest. Um, he, he was the keynote speaker at a conference I was giving a paper at and on narrative and actor network theory. And it, the day hadn't started well when I, I turned up armed with my PowerPoint, and I was told that the, the room I was in didn't have PowerPoint. And because I had designed this with animations and videos and things, uh, this did not all go well. So I had run around like mad getting the slides transferred to acetate, and I arrived at the, um, in the room stressed out to my head, and Art Frank was sitting in the audience, which did nothing to calm my nerves. <laughs> absolutely nothing um, and I don't remember much at all about the presentation but I do remember th that Art actually you know, came up and said some kind words afterwards uh, which I was very grateful for 
Um, you know, now, I'm sure that Art Frank's not sitting there feeling scared stiff to deliver this lecture, but at least I get to say some kind words, all of them very heartfelt. His works had a major influence on development and uptake of narrative as an approach or another way of thinking um, to how especially we understand health and illness, uh, but I think it's wider than that. His book, The Wounded Storyteller, is highly cited and it seems that sometimes you can't actually pick up a health sociology text without coming across his typology of um, restitution, chaos and uh, quest narratives. I was talking to my colleague a while ago and um, she was saying that she and uh, Sue McKenzie Moore and Michelle LaFrance were putting their book together, their recent book together, and they had pages and pages and pages of, apps, of, of excerpts and quotes and things and then every time they came to f find something, you know, they, they needed somebody you know, who had you know, who'd, who said that and that? And they kept coming back to Art Frank's work. And so it was sort of described as that you know, their book was in danger of becoming an Art Frank fanzine. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I want to suggest three reasons, maybe on a serious note, why many of us in the world of narrative find his work so stimulating. For me, first, it's about, it's not only a he, he has a concern not only with um, how people tell stories and what they do with them, but what stories do to us. Yeah? His concept of thinking with stories rather than about stories allows stories to have this life of their own, sometimes unpredictable. And I'm reminded of Tony DeMello's um, comment that the straightest line between truth and a human being is a story. Second, for art, the narrative process is very much an ethical process. In choosing how we tell stories and who to tell them to, in choosing which stories to accept, which to reject, you know, in choosing how we let stories affect us or not, we're making ethical decisions. And I'm not aware of another author who managed to express that absolute dependency of ethics and narrative um, than um, Art Frank. And finally, I think he's avoided the trap that many narrative people, researchers, fall into of simply transferring a sort of you know, narratology light from literature to the rest of life, you know, from literary discourse to sociological discourse. Mika Baal says that there's more to interdisciplinarity than just you know, surface use of a few concepts. And that's right. You know, art has managed to avoid that, I think, in the development of a socio-narratology, specifically for narrative research and, anal and the an analytic enterprise. His book, Letting Stories Breathe, is about how we experience how narrative is wider than literary concepts and concerns. So tonight, He's going to talk about the limits, dangers, and absolute indispensability of stories, exploring a practical form of wisdom that can guide us as individuals to choo in choosing which stories we let into our lives and how they and we let, us, let the stories affect them. As he says, stories are indispensable because they offer us imaginative conceptions of who we can be. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Arthur Frank. Thank you. That very kind introduction, Clive. Um, I want to join what, what Bill Randall said and, and thank Lauren Eagle, who is absolutely, I, I told her when I met her this afternoon that, that she's the queen of, of speaker organizations. Um, I, I have a lot of people who organize me in various places and, and Lauren has just been such a delight to work with and, and so considerate in every way. And uh, thank all of you for getting here tonight, because everybody has other things to do than go off and listen to somebody talk about whatever, and I really appreciate you getting here. This is just uh, a delight for me to be, to be invited to uh, 
to, to be part of what truly has become a distinguished lecture series uh, in narrative internationally. I, I want tonight to, to call upon four specific storytellers uh, whose different problems and different assumptions show us how stories affect our lives. Not just, and here I'm, I'm picking up on what Clive quite properly just said, not just how we humans make up stories, which is how we usually talk about it, but how stories make up us. But I want to preface these four storytellers with a brief epigraph. It comes from one of my heroes, Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan's remarkable memoir, Chronicles. Like me, Dylan grew up listening to the radio before there was television in people's houses. But he's five years older than I am, so he listened to the radio longer than I did. And this is what he writes about radio shows in his youth. I was raised on that stuff. Used to quiver with excitement listening to those shows. They gave me clues about how the world worked and they fueled my daydreams, made my imagination work overtime. Radio shows were a strange craft. That quotation introduces not quite everything that I'm going to say about stories tonight, but a good deal of what I think matters most and what I'm afraid many academic analyses overlook. First, Dylan tells us that he was raised on that stuff. The novelist Maxine Hong Kingston, in her memoir, writes about what she calls stories to grow up on. Some of these stories are told to us by our families. Some we hear in fairy tales or folk tales. Others come to us through mass media. A lot of the stories that I grew up on were the plots of 1950s Broadway musicals, which my mother loved. And those songs were the soundtrack of my early childhood. Working out an appropriate adult relationship to the stories we grew up on strikes me as one of our central developmental tasks and one we probably never finish. So Bob Dylan grew up on radio stories. Dylan then tells us that these radio stories were exciting. I think academic narrative studies often forget that people expect and find varying degrees of excitement in stories. Excitement is one of the main reasons why we're drawn to stories. My colleague Cheryl Mattingly emphasizes the importance of suspense in stories. Suspense matters because suspense builds excitement. The question here is not just what people find exciting in stories. The more significant issue to me is that stories teach people what is worth getting excited about. And that takes me to what I think is Dylan's most crucial lesson about stories. These radio dramas, he writes, gave him clues about how the world worked. And those clues took root and expanded in his daydreams. These two ideas of clues and daydreams seem to me to be inseparable. Any child has to learn how the world works. And she or he gets clues from multiple sources. Observation, overheard talk, talk directed at the child, mass media, and eventually reading. Each source of clues has its particular potency. Those clues stick with us, and they continue to influence us, even when subsequent experience suggests that they may be poor guides to how we conduct our lives. Mass media stories, 
whether these are radio shows, Broadway musicals, YouTube, or video games, become potent forces in our lives because they insinuate themselves in us in our daydreams. These daydreams take a story that we hear and they create spin-offs. Sometimes in these spin-offs we cast ourselves in the role of an established character and we then vary that part to reflect our other fantasies. In other daydreams we may create a new role in the story for ourselves. The point is, and we'll see this in the stories that I'll tell you in a moment, we don't simply hear stories. I think it's better to think of stories as a space that we enter. And when we've entered that space of stories, we engage in a particular form of play. The kind of play that I'm talking about has as its central feature what almost 100 years ago, the social psychologist George Herbert Mead called role taking. In the space created by stories, we play at taking roles of people who we might be or who we never will be. Mead saw this role taking as fundamental to child development. On his account, though, role taking seems to be an unqualified good thing. I'm not quite so sanguine about it. For me, there's a dark side, and I'll try to show that to you in the stories that I'll tell you. I agree with Mead that this play of role taking is indispensable. We can't do without it, but it also happens to be dangerous. Bob Dylan has another important reminder for social scientists when he says that radio stories made his imagination work overtime. After a career in sociology, I believe that social scientists generally fail to be sufficiently serious about the human capacity to imagine and how our imagination shapes our actions. Social scientists overemphasize so-called rational action, and they underappreciate imaginative action, by which I mean acting out a scenario that we've already imagined. Many people's imaginations are working overtime much of the time. Again, that's indispensable, but it's also dangerous. Finally, I like Dylan describing storytelling as a strange craft because that phrase evokes the mixtures of realism and fantasy, of indispensability and danger that stories are for me. A central problem of doing academic work on narrative is how to avoid domesticating the strangeness of stories by subordinating them to some mechanism that academics call method. But tonight, I'll stay away from that issue. I will say that after I titled my recent book, Letting Stories Breathe, and then read Bob Dylan, I wondered if I would have done better to have titled it Keeping Stories Strange. Uh, because then I would have had to do a better job living up to that title. It's difficult to say things about stories academically and at the same time hold on to what truly is strange about almost any story. Well, enough of Bob Dylan. Here's my first story, which I take from the British historian David Sharkey in his biography of Henry VIII. These stories are going to be nothing if not eclectic and disparate. Henry's third wife, whom you all remember was Jane Seymour, has died after childbirth, and his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, has arranged for Henry to marry a German princess, Anne of Cleves. As our story begins, Anne has been brought to England for the wedding, but she's not yet met the king. It's New Year's Day, and she's at a country house in Rochester 
amusing herself by looking out of the window at a bull baiting that's being put on for her in the courtyard below. The official plan is that she will meet the king on January 3rd at Blackheath. Suddenly, six gentlemen burst into the room unannounced, each dressed in identical cloaks and hoods. One of them steps forward, kisses her, and presents her with a gift from the king. He then continues to commune with her, as one witness describes it. That is, he professes his love for her in poetic terms. She's naturally embarrassed by his inappropriate behavior and pays as little attention to him as possible, continuing to watch the bull baiting. He becomes impatient and leaves the room, but returns a moment later dressed as the king. All bow. Anne is twice embarrassed. Here we have a story about the failure of an attempted storytelling, or literally, in this case, a story enactment that fails. Our interest is what went wrong, why the scene did not come off, as the sociologist Irving Goffman would have described it, how it ends instead in mutual embarrassment. Starkey informs us that Henry was reenacting a stock scene from chivalric romances. In these scenes, a lover appears to his beloved in disguise. The storytellers, storytelling convention is that the beloved has the second sight to recognize her lover through any disguise. True love gives people this second sight, and thus the second sight becomes a test of who is truly in love. Henry may or may not have believed in such second sight. What he definitely expected is that Anne would know the storyline, that she would recognize what was being reenacted, and she would immediately take up the appropriate part that was hers to play. The problem is that Anne had been brought up in cloisters where such stories were not told. She heard nice religious stories where she went to school. Starkey puts it succinctly. She had behaved naturally like a peasant rather than artificially like a lady. This story is important to me because of what it shows about the self and what interests sociologists the most, how selves collect themselves into affinities that we call groups. Henry has grown up on these chivalric romances, and they have given him clues about how the world works. Stories have informed his sense of what kind of character he can be and what kind of responses he can expect from others who, he expects, have grown up on the same stories. Maybe not exactly the same stories, but stories that are close enough to have given them the same clues that he takes to be truth. Anne, for her part, is hardly clueless. But her clues come from having grown up on different stories. So in response to Henry's assumptions about the world, she is consequentially clueless. One consequence will be her subsequent, almost immediate separation from Henry. The marriage, as you remember, doesn't last more than a month. A further consequence will be the beheading of Thomas Cromwell. Stories definitely have consequences. Storytelling also has its limits, though, and Anne will prove remarkably adept negotiating her separation from Henry so that, quite remarkably, she retains a respected place at the English court uh, throughout her lifetime. But the failed first encounter between Henry and Anne is a dramatic example of how important stories are 
in people's capacity for affiliation. Who's able to get along with who else and who immediately says, not really my kind of person. Henry's sense of who can be a viable partner in his project of selfhood depends upon sharing particular stories. Again, let me emphasize, the issue is not whether Henry believes the chivalric stories are true in what they tell. The truth of the stories is the expectation that others will be able to collaborate reenacting that story. Stories, of course, change. Chivalric romances, several centuries later, will be radio dramas, which rather quickly will turn into TV sitcoms and eventually become video games and viral YouTube clips. But despite these changes in what the stories are and where they come from, I believe that human terms of membership, again, who affiliates with whom, remain much as they were. In this story I've told you that happens at the juncture of the late Renaissance and the early modern periods and reflects both sensibilities. We affiliate with people who immediately pick up on what stories we are reenacting and who intuitively play their appropriate parts in those stories. And we distance ourselves from people who miss those clues because they have not grown up on the same stories. Henry VIII had what we can call power, a word sociologists use with some trepidation. He had the power to enforce a certain conformity between the stories that he knew and the reality around him. My next storyteller is like Henry in her dedication to a story, but she acts from a position of comparative powerlessness, which makes her dedication dangerous to herself, whereas Henry is mostly dangerous to other people. My second storyteller is Mademoiselle Bourrien, who is a minor character in Tolstoy's War and Peace. I write about her in my book, Letting Stories Breathe, so I'll tell her story very briefly tonight. She exemplifies what's dangerous in Bob Dylan's point about how stories can make a person's imagination work overtime. In doing so, stories can significantly distort a person's sense of reality. To make her story as short as I can, Mademoiselle Bourrien is a well-educated but penniless French woman who works as the companion for the rich Russian Princess Maria. Princess Maria, at least at this point in the book, is not a woman who is immediately attractive to men. Mademoiselle Bourrien is. So, when the poor but noble Prince Anatole is sent by his father to court Princess Maria, he decides to seduce Mademoiselle Bourrien with the intention of marrying the princess and keeping Mademoiselle as his mistress. That seems like him to be a good way to live his life. She goes along with the seduction. Princess Maria discovers them kissing. Anatole is dismissed from the household, a Tolstoyan version of Hit the Road Jack, and Mademoiselle is forgiven. The interesting question is how Mademoiselle Bourrien, who's in a totally vulnerable position in a foreign country, dependent on her employers, how she could be stupid enough to be seduced. And we know it's a significant question because Tolstoy gives us a very specific answer. He tells us that Mademoiselle Bourrien has grown up on a story once told to her by her aunt, in which a young woman is seduced, and just when her seducer is about to abandon her, her dead, dead mother appears, and that appearance shocks the young man into marrying her. Certainly would me. That story becomes Mademoiselle Bourrien's clue 
to how the world works. Or that story as she has, ad as she has adapted it in a spin-off. Uh, because Tolstoy that tells us that over the years Mademoiselle has been retelling the story to herself and varying it in her daydreams. When Anatole finally arrives, life seems to be imitating a story that Mademoiselle Bourrien has forgotten was once an artful fiction. As storytellers, Henry VIII and Mademoiselle Bourrien seem to differ in the following respect. Henry is in a position to use stories to test people. Those who know the story and pick up on cues about which story is being reenacted become his in-group. Others are expelled. By contrast, Mademoiselle Bourrien uses people to test stories. Except she's too naive to understand her actions that way. Her implicit faith in a story causes her to experience Anatole as she does and to respond as she does with all the risks of that response. Yet, despite their differences, Henry and Mademoiselle both are deeply committed to the truth of a story as a model for reality. It would be easy to dismiss Mademoiselle Bourrien as too naive to be real and understand her only as a plot device that Tolstoy is using to underscore the Christian goodness of the princess. As naive as Mademoiselle Bourrien is, and let's be honest, as pathetic as she is, I find her to be representative of many people, including, I must say, me, at various times that I can only recall with embarrassment. We all do things to which the obvious question is, how could you possibly believe that would go well? As often as not, the answer is that we've taken our clues about the world either from a story that misrepresents the world or else we have misapplied the story. By misrepresentation, I don't mean getting certain facts about reality wrong. Myths, fairy tales, and folk tales are full of impossibilities that are presented as facts. And yet, I agree with those who say that these stories do not misrepresent the world. Neither do allegories, science fiction, or magical realism, even though they also relate events that can never actually happen. Part of what makes storytelling such a strange craft, in Dylan's phrase, is that misrepresentation is not a matter of the factual plausibility of what happens. Rather than go further into this very deep water, for tonight, let's understand misrepresentation to be as commonsensical as it seems in Tolstoy's version. And let's understand Mademoiselle Bourrien as someone who has absorbed, not wisely but too well, a story that psychiatrists would call a narcissistic fantasy. That is, it's a story told by a self affirming a fantasy of the self. And the story is unmoored from the reality checks of being told to other people whose reactions become crucial to what clues about reality are taken from the story. Instead of reality testing, Mademoiselle Bourrien gazes into the mirror of the story she has adapted and sees there an idealized version of her life. And then she embraces that reflection. I'm afraid I see her as broadly representative, not only of individuals, but of groups up to and including whole nations. I wrote that sentence in another country, and I'll leave it to you to guess what that might have been. My third storyteller, 
is a stark contrast with Mademoiselle Bourrien. Among these four storytellers, Audre Lorde has been my companion the longest and I feel closest to her. I'd already written my own memoir of having cancer before I read Lorde's extraordinary collection of speeches uh, collected as the cancer journals. Again, I'll truncate the telling of what's been one of my touchstone stories over a couple of decades now. Um, a story about how often it's not disease but health care that's the occasion for ill people's most difficult struggles to sustain personal identity. Lord tells a story about how 10 days after her mastectomy, she goes to see her surgeon to have her stitches removed. She approaches the appointment with confidence that she is regaining what she calls my own flair, my own style. That confidence is shattered for her when the surgeon's nurse, whom Lord has found to be supportive in the past, takes her to task for not wearing a breast prosthesis. You will feel so much better with it on, the nurse tells her. And besides, we really like you to wear something, at least when you come in. Otherwise, it's bad for the morale of the office. When I tell that story in a, uh, in a group of illness survivors, there's an audible gasp in, in the room uh, because so many people have had the same experience. Lord ends the story writing that she was too outraged to speak then, but this was to be only the first such assault on my right to define and to claim my own body. Lord's storytelling differs from the previous storytellers in several respects. She positions herself as what Michel Foucault in his last writings called a truth teller, or in ancient Greek, a paresiast. A paresiast, at least in that word's original usage, tells a truth at some risk to him or herself. A paresiast speaks truth to power. But as I've argued at greater length in previous writing, Lord puts a trickster twist on Parasia. Tricksters are good at getting out of traps. That's what Lord does here. The nurse traps her. And if we read the story carefully, we see that the trap apparently holds during the office visit. Lord tells us she was too outraged to speak then. Later, she tells a story, and through that story, she frees herself, at least retroactively, from the trap. And sometimes retroactively is good enough. Henry VIII and Mademoiselle Bourrien both go into situations with stories guiding their sense of reality. Indeed, stories seem to control their sense of reality and their judgments about how to act. Like them, Audre Lorde goes into her appointment expecting a particular form of narrative to be enacted, but the nurse has a different narrative in mind, and she has at least a qualified capacity to enforce that narrative. Lorde then later tells her own story as an act of self-repair. She tells the story to figure out what went wrong in this appointment, to gain clarity retrospectively. The narrative repair draws upon other stories that Lord has been telling herself for a long time and that prefigure her present story. These include stories about how she's reclaimed her identity both as a lesbian and as an African American. Crucially, the prosthesis story offers Lord a means of holding her own. That's a crucial phrase for me, how people hold their own. By that I mean, after an experience that has undermined her sense of identity and shown her exactly how vulnerable she is in her embodiment, the story is a means of reasserting the self, 
that she has claimed for herself and believes herself to be. Her temporary vulnerability thus becomes a source of long-term strength. Or following Nietzsche, what doesn't destroy her truly does make her stronger. Storytelling is the means by which she transforms vulnerability into strength. She lives according to this narrative that vulnerability is always able to be transformed. My final storyteller, like Audre Lorde, is wounded. This is Philoctetes, the hero of Sophocles' late tragedy of the same name. Philoctetes is a Greek prince who sails with the Greeks when they go to war against Troy. Again, I truncate the story mercilessly for the sake of time. On the way to Troy, Philoctetes is bitten on the foot by a snake. The wound festers, creating an unbearable stench. No one can stand to be close to him. It also causes Philoctetes agonizing pain, and his screams detract the Greeks from the rituals in which they are supplicating the gods uh, to intercede on their behalf in the coming war. Thus, o Odysseus is ordered to abandon Philoctetes on the island of Lesbos, tricking him with a story that everyone else will wait for him while he sleeps. Ten years pass. The Greeks unsuccessfully lay siege to Troy, and finally there's a prophecy that the Greeks will never be victorious until Philoctetes rejoins their forces. Philoctetes' singular warrior capacity comes with his bow, which was given to him by Hercules. The bow never misses. Sophocles' play begins with Odysseus secretly landing on Lesbos, accompanied by the son of Achilles, who by now is dead, um, but his son Neoptolemus has joined them. The younger man is crucial to the plan because Philoctetes knows and hates Odysseus, the one who abandoned him there. Neoptolemus' task is to convince Philoctetes to return with them to Troy by telling him the prophecy that he can achieve greatness conquering the Trojans, and as an added inducement, the Greek physicians are capable of curing his wound. The problem is that Philoctetes has spent a decade telling himself a story that demonizes the Greeks and ends with his revenge against them. So the climax of the play, and again I apologize because I'm leaving out a good deal, is that Philoctetes has a choice. He can either go to Troy, be healed, and win glory in battle, or Neoptolemus has promised, if he chooses, to take him back to the kingdom of his very old father, where his wound will still fester, but he will have the satisfaction of not having helped the Greeks who abandoned him. What happens is less important for our purposes, but I've got to tell you, you want to know. Philoctetes chooses to live out his revenge story. He goes with revenge. He decides he wants to be taken home without glory and without healing. At that point, there is one of the quintessential Greek deus ex machina in which Hercules appears out of the clouds he tells Philoctetes, don't be silly, go to Troy, be glorious. The play ends with Philoctetes departing with Neoptolemus for Troy. The importance of Philoctetes, at least for tonight, is how he represents those situations when two or more incompatible stories, both, seem to have legitimate claims on us. My first three storytellers never have to choose among stories. Their shared limitation is an inability to even imagine alternative stories. Philoctetes, 
story is all about his choice between stories that each make strong calls upon him. Even though it's the oldest of my four stories, it may be the most sophisticated in terms of the dilemma that it poses. A genuine dilemma is when we have two or more stories, each of which has a claim that seems undeniable. For Philoctetes to go home is to deny both healing and the warrior glory that any Greek aspires to. For him to go to Troy is to deny the treachery of his abandonment for 10 years on this island. Most of us, when faced with a similar dilemma, do not have the benefit of a god who suddenly appears and tells us which choice is best for us. We have to live with the limitations and the dangers of our choices about which version of the past we allow to define our present and which version of the future we allow to define our past. As the briefest of conclusions, where does this leave us with respect to three crucial terms? The self, the collectivities that selves enter into, and the dialogue of selves within these collectivities. The self, as I've been imagining it in these four stories, has three dimensions. The self is a collection of stories that provide clues about the world. The self is also a revisable narration of one's past that has implications for one's future. And third, the self is a predisposition to understand new stories to take news stories more or less seriously in terms of how they fit with stories the self already knows and interpretations of those stories either shared in groups, as Henry very much shares his stories with his community of, of peers, or that are developed in an interior monologue as Mademoiselle Bourrien has told herself her aunt's story over and over again. Collectivities, or memberships, comprise people who share both a knowledge of particular stories, so you don't have to tell. Within a membership group, you don't have to tell the whole story. You can just mention the punchline of a joke and everybody laughs, because that's what it is to be members of the same group. You already know those stories. There are people who share a knowledge of particular stories and the interpretation of those stories, so they make sense of stories in the same way. Groups are people who find the same joke funny or the same tragedies sad. For example, as I hear the Henry VIII story, I find Anne of Cleves a considerably less sympathetic character when I learn that she was watching a bull baiting one of the cruelest pastimes of past centuries. It offends my sensibilities. But I immediately recognize that a 16th century listener would not share that interpretation. There would have been nothing strange about that. Perfectly good Saturday afternoon entertainment. Membership groups, from families through workplaces up to faith communities and nations, are defined by the interpretations that members share and the interpretive flexibility that the group either allows or does not allow. Third, both selves and collectivities are held together through dialogue. Audre Lorde tells her cancer treatment story to an audience that will feel affirmed by that story and will affirm her as she tells it. Henry VIII can order affirmation of his story, but it's important to remember that his authority holds because those around him would have shared his interpretive predispositions 
His orders would have seemed right to them even before he ordered. Mademoiselle Bourian's singularly bad judgment is to betray the one person, Princess Maria, who might have engaged her in honest dialogue about whether she was being guided well by a story appropriate to her circumstances. Dialogues mediate the effects of stories in our lives. Because stories are so powerful in shaping how we live, they are necessarily dangerous. Mademoiselle Bourrien's story is dangerous to herself. Henry's story is dangerous to Anne. The nurse's story is dangerous to Audre Lorde, and maybe Audre Lorde's story is somewhat dangerous to the nurse. Stories are dangerous to ourselves and to others. Dialogue is our best means of protecting ourselves against the limitations and dangers of our indisputably necessary stories. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank, for that stimulating exploration of uh, stories and what they're capable of. What I'd like to do is open the floor now uh, so that we can continue that exploration with questions, with comments, and what I'd invite you to do is come down to one of the two mics on either side. Um, and what we'll begin to do is if we have people coming on either side, we'll just take turns back and forth. It always chills the room when you're told you have to leave your seat to ask a question. <laughs> you don't really have to leave your seat to ask a question. I can move the mic. You think we can move the mic? Not yet. I, I got it first. <laughs> Thank you. 
when I was giving workshops on narrative analysis and eventually writing Living Story to Breathe, was the decade that was, was defined geopolitically by 9-11. I, I did this work during the 9-11 the decade. And, and one of the, the things that I, I had to reorient to um, as, as I continue to think about stories and lives during this historically very particular decade, uh, is that if I wanted to find a group who really told their stories um, and who lived by their stories, uh, I, I, should, I should hang out with terrorists. Uh, because these are people who are, who are absolutely committed with a vengeance. To, to their own modes of storytelling. So one of the things that became most important to me were the ways in which stories create and sustain boundaries between groups. And the ways in which some groups, and I, I mentioned this very quickly in the talk, are more or less flexible in the stories that they will allow across those boundaries. Uh, some groups really will not allow exogenous stories. People are not supposed to know them, much less tell them within the group. We just don't do those stories. Other groups are quite narratively permeable. They're quite willing to, to take up stories of, of other groups. I mean, how seriously they take these stories for Barry. Uh, but you won't get in trouble for knowing, telling, taking seriously stories from outside the group. Now I can finally get to, to your question, which is simply, it depends how much the group wants to engage other groups. Uh, there, there are some groups that really want to maintain their narrative boundaries as comparatively impermeable. And, and, and if we could use fundamentalist in a generic sense, um, that's, that's how I would characterize that position. That it has a very strong sense of, of narrative boundaries. And, and in, in Mary Douglas's classic anthropological sense of pollution, um, it, it fears that, that one becomes polluted by knowledge of stories from outside the group. Um, and so these, these groups will often be um, at least highly circumspect, if not negative, in education. Um, they, they want education to be extremely insular. Uh, the idea of, of, of education being cosmopolitan uh, is anathema to them. Uh, they, they just, that, that is not, you should not live that way. Um, other groups take narrative cosmopolitanism for granted. Um, most, most North American parents um, would assume it was part of their parental duty to tell their children folk tales from other countries. Um, we, we would, in fact, if, if anything, the North American proclivity is, is too much. The cosmopolitan proclivity is to uproot stories from, from wherever they came. and, and and tell them as if really all of the stories are, are you know, interchangeable in some way. Uh, this is the dilemma that, that we really face. Uh, but I think in, until groups have, have, been, have asserted a willingness um, for, for a degree of cosmopolitan engagement, um, that is, until they're willing to, to hear the stories of other groups, then I'm afraid we're, we're not just passing as the ships in the night, we're, we're <laughs> bombarding each other. Um, you know, it's the ships across a, a, an unbridgeable channel. And, uh, and, and from a narrative perspective, much of the world's problems are, are whether people in certain groups are able to take seriously the, the stories coming from other groups. Um, that, that strikes me as, as what, again, from a narrative perspective, was, was so terribly self-defeating, defining the last decade around the metaphor of a war on terror. This is not the, the metaphor you want to employ if, if what matters is, is a, an, an openness of stories to others. 
and, and understanding what those stories mean in the context of those other people's lives. Does that get your question? lecture in a room like this, there's no microphone, but then when it's an evening lecture event, you have to have a microphone. <laughs> the, uh, the last question begs another question, as does your answer, which is, uh, are there ways to tell stories that increase the likelihood that they will be accessible to other groups? Exactly, yeah, very much so. Um, and, and like a lot of issues in life, I think the, the negative is probably the clearer answer. There certainly are ways of telling stories that decrease their accessibility to other groups. There's certainly ways of telling stories that make them much more insular. And, and a lot of faith communities really excel in, in telling their stories uh, in ways that, that, that assert boundaries um, around those. Um, one of my favorite stories about that issue um, is a, a story that I, I read in one of Joseph Campbell's books. And then, I don't know if you have this problem in New Brunswick, but, but my house is infested with, with these, these book demons. That they get into my books and they move the passages around. And I, I, I then try to go back and find this again in, in, the, in, in my collection of books, and, and they just it, it, it had gotten shuffled, but I've never been able to find it. So maybe I made it up, but I'm not really sure at this point. Anyway, when Joseph Campbell was still quite a, a young fellow in the late 1940s, he was invited to uh, participate in New York in a seminar uh, with the, the, the theologian and, and folklorist, among other things, Martin Buber. And, uh, and the, the, the discussion came around to um, practices of sacrifice among people in the in the Middle East in the biblical period. And Campbell made the point that human sacrifice must have been, been at least something that, that the, the biblical period Jews were willing to, to think about given the story of, of Abraham and Isaac. And, and Buber apparently looked at, this is Campbell's retelling of it, Buber looked at it and said, we believe that God spoke to Abraham. Now, that's a very good example to me of using a story to create a boundary. And it's a good example of what I meant when I said that membership groups are those who share a certain interpretation of stories. Um, within Buber's we, always one of life's most dangerous words, uh, within we, we are defined, a boundary is set around people who A, believe that, that God spoke at least to the patriarchs, and, and B, that moral action is then dictated by accordance to that speech, not by the, the nature of the act itself. And, and there's, there's a pretty effective boundary. Either you're on, you, you accept those presuppositions of the story, or you just don't. And in that case, you may know the same story that we know, but it's not our knowing of the story. That, that illustrates the extreme difficulty of, of your question. Um, I think most stories call upon people who share an interpretive bias. Um, and at the other end of the, of the storytelling continuum, the obvious example are jokes. Uh, you, you've all had the experience, I'm sure, of being in some group where somebody tells a joke and everybody laughs and you don't think it's funny. In fact, you may think it's deeply offensive. Or vice versa. It's your group and somebody tells a joke and you see somebody else who's, who's not laughing. Um, we, that's what I mean by an interpretive bias. We find the same kind of thing funny. Or we find the same kind of thing sacred. But either way, the group has a boundary around itself 
depending on those who are willing to enter into that interpretation and those who aren't. The difficulty of your question, and it really is a profound question, is how much you would be asking the believer to give up to dilute the story to a level where it's, it, it's perfectly acceptable to those outside the group. That's the extreme difficulty of it. So to, to, to go back to, to Michelle's question before, and, and here I think we're, we're into material that I'm, I'm just really trying to work out for myself. Um, the issue is that, that we, need, we need to understand how other people understand their stories. We also need to respect the otherness of that story. And we need to figure out what we can talk about even while we respect the, the, the mutual otherness of our own stories. I think that's about as far as, as I can take it. And if, if you and I can take it further, we can win the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> can I uh, please? Yeah, I want to. I want to go back to Campbell. Um, can you find my story for me? I can't. They know I don't. Okay. I, you know, I don't okay. know. It's been as long, probably, for almost the whole semester. One of the things that we know about Campbell is that he was accused of being an anti-Semite. Um, and I, I guess I want to try to get at what you were just talking about at the end, where, where we, we use stories. All of us are identified, most of us are identified with the cosmopolitan outlook. Um, we hope that Campbell, I mean, you use Campbell, I think, with that in mind. I'm wondering if he wasn't doing something else. I'm wondering if he wasn't trying to set up the binary that, that we have, that, that he was actually um, <laughs> at least in the retelling of it, who knows what happened, but in the retelling of it, trying to say, look, look at those people, those other people who aren't like us. And I think, well, I think we have a danger all the time. I mean, stories are so potent, you said yourself, mm -hmm. that, that we, we have to, well, I'm just saying what you just said again, we have to be over there. Mm -hmm. uh, how much can we? How much can you say about those people's story? Abraham and Isaac is a notoriously dangerous story. Uh, Kierkegaard found it dangerous. Karen Armstrong has written very interesting interpretations of its, of its dangers. Um, it's, it's an extraordinarily dangerous story. It, 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 and, and I think the, uh, the very nice twist that you, you put on this, and as you say, how do we know? Um, you know, we, we would at minimum want to have other witnesses. And, and people who, situations where there have been other witnesses collected, all you do is proliferate the number of stories. You know, you never get at it. And I'm fascinated with, with those situations as well. We'll talk more about that. Um, that uh, I call stories being out of control in letting stories breathe. And, and you just illustrated that really nicely, that, that you can always retell a story, perhaps varying it even just the slightest bit, or perhaps putting, adding some different information to it as you reframe the story, given what, yeah, apparently really was. I, I understand that, that Campbell wasn't so much specifically anti-Semitic as he was just an all-around you know, bigoted racist, really. And, uh, that was just one of the many groups that he was you know, quite willing to, to, to tee off on. Uh, he didn't single out, you know. Um, and, but, but it shows how complicated people are. Because you read his books, and, and here's someone with the broadest cultural appreciation of, of people and their belief systems. But it apparently wasn't how he was in person. So there's all that complexity. But, but what's interesting tonight is that by adding that, that frame to the story, you give the story a whole other twist. And, and then the story is out of control in the sense that, that you could add something else to it. And so on, and so on, and so on. And, and that's how stories are. That's, that's part of their trickster quality. 
Tricksters aren't just characters in stories. The reason why there's so many trickster stories and why trickster stories are so paradigmatic of stories generally is that I think stories themselves are tricksters. Stories themselves are always slipping out of the interpretive traps that we set for them. As soon as we try to pin a story down and say, I'm going to use this as an example of this, then something comes along exactly like your question and says, wait a minute, I can get that story out of that interpretation. We'll, we'll just add this bit of information. And, uh, and, and so the story will, will just keep on slipping away from us over and over again. But that's perhaps a bit of a cosmopolitan analog. And there would be some people who would say, no, no, the story's not out of control. This is what the story means. And this is why the interpretation of that story is closed. And it stops here. And so I think there, there still is, I'm sorry you instituted a binary here. I realize that's academic bad form. But there really are two different fundamental attitudes here for stories. One in which the story is, is always revisable, and one in which we are those who know what the story means, and it stops there. You, you can speak to that if you, if you want to. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> we have time for one last question. I see it somewhere. Uh, you were talking about the story being out of control. These days, for for youth to find stories, it's so easy. They mm -hmm. just turn on the computer, they find millions of stories, mm -hmm. literally. How do you see that affecting them in the future? And what is it? <laughs> what is it that we we can do in terms of uh, making it more controllable? Oh, okay. It, these rooms often have plenty of acoustics, so let me repeat my version of the story for those in the back. I, I can hear you very clearly, but voices just don't travel back very well. Um, the, the, the story took up, um, actually what I'm, I'm trying to write about right now, it's a very appropriate question to what I'm working on. Uh, we live at a time when, when a proliferation of stories is only a keystroke away on the computer. Uh, and that, that's what I meant about viral YouTubes, you know, chat groups. There are, there are a multitude of stories that, that are out there. And, and, the, and I, I would agree with you in, in the assertion that, uh, that, that there are a lot of, of people who are heavily wired um, who spend their time absorbing vast numbers of stories. And, and the question was, what's the implication of that for, for these people? Um, you, you, you said at the end, raised the possibility of should this be controlled in some way, um, which is which is a, a provocative word, control, to use with, particularly with respect to the internet. Um, because of course, th there are a lot of, of governmental regimes that are, that are spending enormous resources precisely to control the internet. It's, it strikes them as what needs to be controlled. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a huge question. Um, that really opens up this, this whole other lecture in, in terms of, of what, um, what, whether too many stories can overwhelm our, our, the importance of storytelling. Um, I mean, I, as, as I understand your concern, it, it basically could be described as a condition of inflation. Um, if we have too many stories, does the value of any one story uh, is, it, is that value lost by, by an excess of, of supply? Um, I guess, in some ways, I'm really worried about the opposite problem. Um, I'm worried about the problem that my colleagues in mass media talk about all the time, and some of you may be specialists in that, of, of the increasing tendency of people to get their current events news stories from niche sources. Uh, and the breakdown of traditional newspapers that had to appeal to readers who had a wide variety of beliefs and backgrounds. Um, instead, we live in an area and an age of, of niche news um, where, where people go to particular sites that report stories 
from the interpretive bias that the people already have who go to those sites. And so politically conservative people go to Fox News, politically liberal people go, and so on. Um, and it's, it's really the, the way in which, the, the somewhat paradoxical way in which the, the very proliferation of stories has forced people into far more restricted niches um, than they were when, when there were fewer story outlets. And, and therefore, those, those outlets had to be much more ecumenical in the, the, the way in which they spoke. They had to appeal to a broader variety. Um, nowadays, it's, it's possible to, to, to be a, a niche storyteller on Twitter, for example, and, and have you know, thousands of followers. Um, and, and, and there's a serious political point being made that some politicians who will have several hundred followers on Twitter um, convince themselves that this represents a national consensus. That's really a problem. Um, there's so many other things that, that could be said about this. Um, ultimately, I, I guess I don't see it, I don't see the proliferation of stories, though, as, as the problem that your, your question might have implied. Um, I think it, it simply intensifies the, the need for programs like CERN. Um, the, the, the thing I like about CERN is, is not build your, your, your pun on whether it's the same as the, as the large collider. Um, it's it's the, that CERN is also the root of discernment. I, I think that, that what narrative programs need as, as, as their pedagogical task um, is, to, is to teach people what each of my four storytellers could, could use some more work on, um, which is, is what's a good story in their lives. Each of these storytellers has a, an ethical problem. Um, it's most, most evident with Philoctetes. Philoctetes literally you know, comes down to this dilemma. Is this the good story or is this the good story? But it's just as true for the other story. And, and while I, I have more or less sympathy with each of the other three, um, I do note that, that each, each doesn't engage in a whole lot of, of reflective work going through the, the other stories that are available and, and trying to decide which is best. I would hope that as narrative figures into university programs as a crucial part of pedagogy, uh, what it teaches young people is is which stories they want to take on as their own. Which stories are offering them clues about lives that are truly worth living. And I think that's the challenge that the internet proliferation of stories presents to us. It's a great place to end. Thank you. Thank you all very much.